So let us get back to our Kyle model with fragmented markets. Yeah, uh, how do we set it up? Say that now instead of one market, we just have two markets. And in each market, we have a dealer who is still competitive. In each market, we also have one insider who knows uh, exactly what the asset value V is. But we split our noise traders into two. So we split this order flow U from noise traders into U1 and U2. And we say that those are independent. So we just split these two crowds into two crowds and send them to different markets. And what we will do is we will compare the case when we have these two different markets with the case when everyone participates in the same market or all noise traders are part participating in the same market. So first of all, basically what we do, how do we solve uh, this new model? We solve it in absolutely the same way. The only difference is that we will now have uh, things in each market. I, I realize I have not added, added enough indices here. So this should be lambda IQI, so price impact in market I times the order flow in um, market I should generate our price in market I, and this should also be lambda I. But so the general idea here is that we solve every market just as we did before. And really, 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 the only significant difference is that we will have volatilities. Uh, let me try again. Sigma UI instead of Sigma U in each market. So we can start by looking at uh, market prices that will result in any give in these fragmented markets. And we will see that uh, PI, the price that will result in market I, that will we and that we will end up settling on in market I, is given by this expression. Once again, it's absolutely absolutely the same as what you would have obtained in the consolidated market, except for this term. So what do you see? is if we take the expected value of this price, then all of this last term will go away because expectation of UI is zero. So PI will be equal to this term on average, which is the same as in consolidated market, meaning that prices will still be the average, uh, will still be the same on average in both markets and the same as in the consolidated market. In the very short run, the prices will be different due to this term. But if you uh, will look, for example, for the variance of PI, and you'll see that this sigma UI will cancel out with the well, variance of UI. So variance of each price PI will be the same as variance of price in the consolidated market. So this was practice aspect. Now let us get to more interesting aspects. Uh, question. How about arbitrage opportunities on the short run? So we are currently shutting those down. We are saying that these two markets are completely isolated. And what is happening in these markets is happening simultaneously. Meaning, at this given minute and second, Informed and uninformed traders are submitting their market orders. One second later, the prices are realized. So nobody can really act upon these prices being different. Well, because they cannot trade across markets. But the way you can think about it is, uh, yeah, it happens simultaneously. So once prices are realized, the dealers are also keeping track of, on keeping track of what happens in the other market. So once both of these 
batches are cleared in both markets, the dealers observe both pieces of information and then kind of PIs converge back to the same level. So that's one way to think about it. But a simpler way to think about it is to just say that these markets are completely isolated and you cannot uh, trade across both of them because they are, for example, in different countries and it's different to move funds across the border. Something like that. But yeah, so prices are not much different, so it's not uh, really an interesting item to focus on anyway. Slightly more interesting aspect is uh, trading volumes. So if we compute our uh, XIs, the trading volumes by informed traders in both markets, then we will, of course, have linear strategies, just as we had before. Beta I's are um, given by ratios of volatilities, so sigma UI divided by sigma V. I hope that you can see it. It might have been a little too small, but I guess it's too late to worry about that now after three lectures. So I hope you can see it. Or you have the slides at hand. So, uh, the bottom line is, if we take the total trading volumes in the two markets and we sum them together, we will have uh, this expression. V minus mu times the sum of sigma uis divided by sigma v. And we need, we need to compare it to the order size in the consolidated market, which is just v minus mu times sigma u divided by sigma v. So what we need to compare is we need to find out if the sum of sigmas of sigma u's is greater or smaller than uh, sigma u of the joint uh, order size of the uninformed traders. And you can use very, very basic math to do it. And this is here. So what we know, just by design, is that the total u in the consolidated market is equal to u1 plus u2. This is just what we assumed. If we take variances of the two of these variables, then we get that variance of u is sigma u square. Variance of u1 plus u2 will be sigma u1 plus sigma u2 plus the covariance of u1 and u2, which is zero because we assume that they are independent. So what you will get is this expression. Sigma u square equals to the sum of squares. But the sum of squares is smaller than the square of the sum. So I can do it this way, yeah. Because sigma u1 plus sigma u2 squared equals sigma u1 squared plus sigma u2 squared plus 2 sigma u1 sigma u2, which is positive. So what we know is sigma u square is smaller than the square of the sum of sigmas, meaning that in the very end, sigma u is smaller than sigma u1 plus sigma u2. Again, fifth grade math. Well, plus some first-year university probability theory, I guess. But what we end up with is the fact that total order size in the, cons uh, in the fragmented market will be greater than the order size in the consolidated market. So informed traders will be more aggressive in total in the fragmented markets. So this is not by itself necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is how it translates into profits. So if you compute profits of informed uh, traders, which will be equal to the expected loss of the uninformed traders, you'll end up with this expression. Sigma V times the sum of sigma U's divided by two and once again, this expected loss of the uninformed traders will be greater uh, than in the consolidated market because of the relation on sigma u's.
And, well, you already see the problem now. The loss of the uninformed traders is larger in the fragmented market. That's usually a bad thing because they are uh, the, the least protected group of our market. They are the group that suffers the most just from the outset of it. They are the only one who operate at a loss. And we probably want to minimize this loss, maybe. Not 100%, but maybe we want to minimize this loss. If we do, then fragmentation is bad because the total loss of noise traders in fragmented market is greater than it is in a consolidated market. So what it might lead to, just using the logic from last week, is that noise traders are operating at a greater loss, so they will have less incentives uh, to participate in the market. So in the end, in the long run or in the medium run, you will have fewer noise traders in the market. Again, not part of the model, but you can think that these sigma u's will just decrease and liquidity will slowly trickle away from the markets to more liquid markets, markets in some other assets, maybe. So this is something we don't really want. Informed traders, of course, will thrive in fragmented markets. They'll have greater profits. They'll have more incentives uh, for participation. Do, do we care about that? Um, uh, I don't know. Probably not per se. We do not want to reward informed trading that much. Uh, just because it distorts market prices. But on the other hand, it also leads to price discovery. So more informed trading means more price discovery, so we don't really know. One point of order here. Our comparison that we are running here is not 100% uh, correct or appropriate. Because what we are comparing is we have one speculator per market in the fragmented market. And we are also looking at the model with one speculator in the consolidated market. So if, if we look instead at a consolidated market with two speculators who are competing with one another, then you'll see that their profit in the consolidated market is even lower than it is in a consolidated market with just one speculator. Meaning that speculators really, 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 really like fragmented markets and they really want to split across different fragmented markets. So, um, not going to price discovery yet. So we mentioned it, we will come back to price discovery a little later. But before that, let us talk about market depth and how it what is the effect of fragmentation on market depth. The way the book approaches it is saying that uh, depth in each market is lower than in the consolidated market. This may or may not be trivial. I think it is slightly trivial. Because obviously, if you just split your orders perfectly between the two markets, then even if your kind of aggregate depth stays the same, your depth in any given market uh, will be lower than it was in the consolidated market. So this is not really an interesting finding. And uh, what I think is more appropriate is looking at the aggregate depth. Now, the book does not do it. There may or may not be a good reason to not do it. But let's do it nonetheless and see what happens. So now, suppose that U, where U is undefined, you want to trade uh, X units of the asset. And now we're thinking of U as some kind of super investor who actually can access both markets simultaneously. So I, I built a world where these two markets were completely isolated and now I'm violating my own rules. So yeah, suppose that now we have this one investor who 
uh, wants to trade this amount but can split order across the two markets and do so optimally, for example. Uh, so what would happen is this trader would equalize the marginal prices across the two markets. Right, so look at this as a sequential problem. I have X units to trade in total, say 10, and I can do this uh, one by one. So I decide where to trade my first unit. Is the price in market one lower than market two or not? I will choose this for the first unit. Then once I have traded my first unit, say, once I've bought the first unit, where is it cheaper to buy the second unit? on market one where I have already bought the first unit so the price is a little higher or on market B where the price was a little higher from the start but maybe it's lower now uh, after I bought one unit in, mar in market one. So you will always buy kind of every next unit where it is cheaper so you will uh, in the end split order so as to equalize the marginal prices. So the price of the last unit bought in any single market. And saying that X1 and X2 are your uh, volumes in any given market, this optimality condition will look like this. Just solving it for X's, we can obtain that um, the order in market I, this should be lambda J, but the yeah, I'm thinking of a good way to say it. You will submit a larger order to a deeper market. So this would be x2. The larger is lambda 2. The larger is this whole fraction. Uh, the, the larger share of your total order x you submit to market 2. I will fix the indices afterwards. Uh, so the resulting price in every market will be given by this equation, while in the consolidated market if you traded the total order of x you would have this price. So what we need to compare is we need to compare this fraction lambda 1 times lambda 2 divided by sum of lambdas uh, with this one lambda in the consolidated market. And if you plug in the lambdas that you obtain in equilibrium, so expressed in terms of sigmas, what you will obtain is this. You will get that the aggregate depth, the, the resulting price of the marginal unit in the fragmented market will be lower than the marginal price than the price of the marginal unit in the consolidated market. So fragmented market will be deeper in aggregate terms. Once again, this analysis is a little bit cheeky in that we think some traders can operate across markets, some cannot, and there is a bit of a subtlety in that. And no, not another. This is it. Okay, so that's it for the depth. We see that there is actually at least one perk to fragmentation. It increases total depth. Now let us turn back to price discovery, which we briefly mentioned. And back then we kind of said that the amount of informed trading is a proxy for price discovery. Now let us verify this more explicitly. So what we had, once again, in lectures, what I uh, gave you 100% no scam guarantee is true, is this expression. That given the normality of all the variables, V, U, and that's it, we can express the conditional expectation of the fundamental value V conditional order size in this linear form, and that's where our linear price equation also comes from. Now, would you be surprised if I told you that this expression also holds in vector form? 
Meaning, we now what what we now want to do is we now want to find the distribution of V conditional on what happens in the two markets. So conditional on the information that was revealed in two markets. And you can see it as a vector uh, Q1, Q2. This is one manifestation of this information that we get from the two markets. Equivalently, it's the same as conditioning on uh, the vector of prices that happened in the two markets. So you don't really need to observe trade quantities. You just need to see the resulting prices, uh, P1 and P2. So this is just because the prices are uh, linear in quantities, so they have one-to-one -one correspondence. So what you can do, the way you can find this uh, V conditional on Q, for the expectation, you will have a vector of covariances times, um, let me maybe write it for once, six, this. So what you'll have is expectation of V conditional on Q1, Q2 will be equal to mu as before, plus uh, C, T, the row vector of covariances between V and Q, times the inverse of the variance matrix of Q, times the column vector of the actual Qs. So to clarify, C is the uh, covariance vector between V and Q, and V is uh, the variance of Q. And here, uh, I guess you should clarify that these are all vectors. So vector of quantities, okay? But once everything is normal, we can write our price like this in matrix uh, notation. And it, it's uh, just as easy to find, to calculate all these covariance and variances as we did in class. It's a little more work. And here you have to take an inverse of a matrix, which I personally never liked, but you might have some better uh, mental math rules than I do. So yeah, you, you can do that. This will give you conditional expectation of V, conditional the information revealed in quantities. And if you believe me to do the math, which you should not, but if you believe the textbook to do the math, uh, then you should believe that the conditional expectation of V is equal to this expression. Now, what we are actually interested in for price discovery is not the conditional expectation. So this was just a nice addition and small little tour to, I guess, probability, Bayesian inference. Yeah, so what we actually care about is not the conditional expectation, but rather the residual variance of V. So this variance of V conditional on the vector of prices or equivalently quantities tells us how, basically how much we do not know about V after we observe P. So what's the residual uncertainty about V after we get to observe the outcomes in the both markets? And so what you can find in this market is that this residual uncertainty is equal to sigma square V divided by three. While in the consolidated market, we had this residual uncertainty equal to uh, sigma square V divided by two. So there, our informed trader revealed one half of his information. Here, the two markets together reveal two thirds of the information, only one third is known is left unknown, sorry. So in the end, fragmented market yields us better price discovery according to this analysis. And here the idea is, yeah, we have more signals from which to learn about V. So this is kind of a more statistical reasoning, right? We have two 
um, perfect signals of V, the axes, the trade sizes, uh, plus two different error terms, U1 and U2. But the fact that we have two different error terms allows us to uh, extract the signal more precisely. So the very, very basic statistical reasoning, the more, uh, the larger is your sample size, the better is your inference. There is one caveat to this analysis, at least one. And this once again relates to us having uh, two speculators in two markets compared to one speculator in one market. And here, if back in the trading profits, fixing this uh, sketchy assumption on the reinforced our results, here it will not be the same. So we did, in one of our exercise classes, a problem on imperfect competition of speculators um, in a Kyle model. And if you go back there, and if you compute their expected profits, and sorry, not profits, but if you compute residual uncertainty in that model, what you will get is that if you have two speculators in one market, then your residual uncertainty of V will be still equal to exactly this. Uh, sigma square V divided by 3. More generally, if you have N speculators in one market, your residual uncertainty will be given by sigma square V divided by N plus 1. So here, splitting these speculators into two markets does not give us better price discovery. It does not make it worse, it does not make it better. It just gives these speculators more profits. But it does not actually improve price discovery. So, uh, I want you to keep both of these conclusions in mind, but more the latter one because this is the more appropriate comparison. So, in the very end, fragmenting the markets does not really uh, affect price discovery that much. So much for price discovery. Let us look at yet another aspect. So, as I told you, for, for this model we are assuming that traders are really chain bound to their markets they cannot leave their prison uh, their sandbox of their own market and cannot trade uh, with another market what if they could what if they could uh, switch to another market or participate in both markets what would happen then so let us start with the speculators with the informed traders if they could choose which market to commit to, so if they could choose one market to participate in, then we have already discussed that they would um, coordinate as to split across different markets. Because that's how they avoid competing with each other, and this leads to better profits for them, right? But that's only if they can commit to staying within one market and avoiding another market. If these speculators um, both participate in both markets simultaneously, then fragmentation has absolutely no effect and we are basically back to consolidated market. So if speculators compete with each other across both markets, the outcome in the fragmented market will be exactly the same as the outcome in the consolidated market where two speculators are still competing with each other. So in that sense, this restriction, uh, li the fact that we are limiting traders to some market and part not participating in the other market is really what drives our analysis here. And if you think that there is some fixed cost of participating in the market, that is one justification, one possible justification of this assumption. Now, that was for speculators. What if we look at the noise traders? 
What if they can choose where to trade? So think of it as we have many, many small noise traders and our total order size U or U1 or U2 was composed of the sum of these individual traders' demands. So when one individual trader can choose which market to participate in, they would really choose the one that is deeper. Because they kind of submitting this fixed uh, order size. So they just want to get the best price they can for that order size. And the best price corresponds to, uh, the best price arises in deeper markets. So what this means is if you have a deeper market, if market A already has more traders that provide more depth than market B, then traders from market B actually want to switch to market A. Liquidity providers tend to cluster at those markets which are already, which already have a lot of liquidity provision. So noise traders like to bunch together. They would like to coordinate on one market. And you can think of it that, that uh, large markets get larger or liquidity begets liquidity. So this fact constitutes kind of a natural barrier to entry for uh, all the new trading platforms, for all the new exchanges that want to enter. Right, because what they should do is they should not just attract some volume of trade, but they should attract a critical mass of traders such that the market would tip and basically all other traders that have a choice would organically choose to flow to the new platform. So... Yeah, they, they want to. They want to seem large enough. They want to grow large enough to grow further, to grow further. That's, I guess, one way of saying it. And this, this is exactly what uh, generates those payments for order flow that we discussed earlier today. Why exchanges actually want to pay brokers to attract order flow, even if it's. Um, even if it's just raw order flow, not uninformed traders, but just send all order flow our way. That's how you grow volumes and that's why you want to do it. Another cool manifestation, I guess, of this effect, if nothing else, is that uh, if you look at the structure of fees on exchanges, what you will see is that markets, uh, sorry, exchanges charge positive fees for market orders. But uh, quite often, uh, some of them charge negative fees for limit orders, for order submission. And this is once again to incentivize liquidity provision because uh, the market can only exist if limit traders choose to go to this market. So limit traders would actually be compensated for submitting limit orders in those markets, which I think is in really interesting. So this was it for the fragmented Kyle model. So we have looked at the Kyle model. We added some market fragmentation. There were some strange assumptions that we, that we possibly made, but uh, some conclusions are nonetheless relatively robust to it. In particular, we can infer that fragmentation is bad for noise traders, and you can think that it's bad for welfare. Uh, I'm not sure why I added welfare here. Just forget it. It's bad for noise traders. And, uh, yeah, if 
noise traders have an incentive to coordinate on choosing some market, but not another. On the surface level in our analysis, fragmentation may also create extra depth, but this does not account for this first channel. So this extra depth does not account for the fact that noise traders get lower profits and thus may in the end uh, end up leaving the markets and so the final depth will be lower. So results regarding depth are slightly ambiguous. Now one note that I would like to make here is so far we have seen fragmentation as uh, there have been many different trading platforms, uh, physically distinct or different online trading systems that use different software, so just different limit order books, one way or another. But another way you can think about fragmentation is think that the same limit order book at different times is a different market. Right? If I am submitting market order right now at 2.49 p.m., I am participating in the market at 2.49 p.m. and I am not participating in the market at 4.30 p.m. So these are two different markets for me. In this sense, uh, if we interpret fragmentation in this sense, then we can apply some of our analysis to draw conclusions about um, this kind of intertemporal fragmentation and explain some of the empirical regularities. In particular, one thing that is true in the real world is that trading volume is quite concentrated at uh, well at specific times of day, in particular close to market opening and just before the market closes. You can think of it exactly as, the, as of noise traders coordinating. So all of them just coordinating on submitting all of their orders either early or late in the day because they want to submit their orders when all other liquidity traders are also submitting their orders and so on. So this may explain this kind of uh, trading pattern within a day. And um, so another consequence of interpreting fragmentation in the intertemporal way is we can apply our analysis to compare batch trading versus continuous trading. So batch trading would be a consolidated market. All orders will be pulled together and cleared simultaneously. All orders within an hour, I don't know, a day, within some time interval. Whilst uh, continuous trading is uh, the fragmented market. So in this case, we have a lot of different markets at all the different points in time. So you can apply our analysis to this comparison. Okay, so we don't have much time left, but we have some more things to do. We have looked at one model and we have looked at um, how fragmentation manifests in Kyle model. And if you have any questions to ask about Kyle model, this might be the good time. Because otherwise we will very, very quickly look at some of the other models that we had in this course. And we will see how fragmentation, has manif how fragmentation manifests itself in those models and how it affects market outcomes. So one model that we had was a Stoll's model that explained limited liquidity and depth in the market through dealer's risk aversion. And that's what we called inventory risk. So just to give you a very quick refresher, I don't think we'll be going through this model in great detail. But what we do have uh, in this model is we still have the same asset value V. I can't remember if, if we assume that it's normal uh, back in the lecture when we cover it. But uh, here we no longer have any informed traders. We only have a risk averse dealer with some mean variance preferences or mean standard deviation preferences. And we have a trader, probably a noise trader. And what we want to focus on here 
is um, the pricing schedule of the dealer that, since the dealer is competitive, yields zero profit for the dealer. Here, this pricing schedule would um, also be non-trivial, so it will not be flat. You, we will have a linear price impact equation due to inventory risk, due to risk aversion of the dealer. Because if the dealer has, for example, long position in the asset, he will want to charge a very low buy and sell price because this large long position is very risky. So the seller would want to, the dealer would want to unwind this position. He would prefer to sell assets. So he would charge a low price. Yes, a low price to attract buyers who want to buy cheaply and uh, to deter sellers away who will not want to sell cheaply. That was the big idea behind Stoll's model. And um, so what happens if we look at fragmentation within the context of this model? So once again, we have two different markets with two risk-averse dealers, and they are uh, trying to create zero-profit trading schedules. The effect that happens in this market, and I will not look or talk about the math, but what happens in these markets is, if we compare these two markets to a one consolidated market in which both of these traders, um, both of these dealers can effectively trade with each other and equalize their positions, right? In that case, they are insuring each other in a consolidated market. So the fact that they can trade with each other means that they can balance their positions with each other, which means that their total risk-taking capacity will be larger. In fragmented markets, they would be um, not be able to insure each other, so each of them will be uh, willing to trade less. Now this, once again, this kind of broad intuition that I very quickly painted here relies on the fact that uh, there is no connection between the markets. So we have not discussed who trades with the dealers, but we are kind of assuming that these traders are also bound to one market. Because if they are not, if our trader is once again that super trader who can split the order across the two markets, then our dealer, the, sorry, this trader, the super trader will once again act so as to equalize the marginal prices. So just like we did in the Kyle's model. And equalizing marginal prices is effectively what is providing insurance to the dealers. So this trader who can act in both, uh, this trader who can trade in both markets will act as the insurance device for the dealers and fragmentation will have no effect. So that was a little quick and I guess vague without the math. The bottom line is if you isolate dealers from one another, they cannot provide insurance to each other so uh, they will not be willing to take as much risk in total because they will not have access to this extra channel of insurance. Now, I do not think that this is a very valuable point to take away because in reality, there are plenty of inter-dealer markets and uh, even with fragmented markets, dealers are still trading with each other uh, across markets and providing insurance to each other. So I do not really think that this risk uh, sharing motive is a good reason for consolidation. So that was a very, very, very quick venture to Stoll's model. And let us just as quickly look at Gloston's model of limit order book of uh, order driven markets. So the way, um, no, what we can obtain in Gloston's model 
is uh, that aggregate depth of the fragmented market will be once again larger than depth of the consolidated market. So this will be the same conclusion as we had in the Kyle's model, but this will come from a very different uh, place and for very different reasons. Now I'm running out of time, so I, I don't think I will go through it because it is quite a while, uh, but I will upload the slides, so I urge you to take a look at it. And here the peculiar feature is that uh, we will assume that market orders are behaving in a very specific way. So, th okay, let me let me probably set up the model. I will not go through the solution, but let me set it up so you are slightly less confused by it. So, the main pricing equation that we had in the Glostens model looked like this. So, to remind you, it connects the a any given ask price. A, we, are, we were without loss looking at the ESC side of the market. So this equation connects A and the cumulative depth Y provided up to this price. And we were saying that limit orders uh, are submitted to the market up until the marginal limit trader gets zero profit. And this is exactly the equation that generates zero profit. So this marginal trader will supply the wife unit of uh, liquidity in the market. And this will be the last unit supplied at price A. So now in this fragmented model, we are once again assuming two markets, but now we are imposing slightly richer structure on it. So we are saying that markets are asymmetric slightly. In particular, there is an incumbent market, I, and the new entry market, E, you can think of these not as market, but as exchanges. So E is a, a new platform that is being launched. Now fix some ask price A. It need not be the only one available at the, pri at, uh, the markets, but uh, just fix some price A and look at market liquidity at this price A. That's what we'll be doing. So say that um, market I has YI units available at prices up to A, and market E has YE units available at prices up to A. And the way market um, traders behave is on the surface the same as we had before. So they are buying or selling with probability one, two, uh, one half. And their order size is uh, distributed according to some distribution F. This is the CDF. The interesting way is how they split their orders across the two markets, I and E. And with probability 1 minus gamma, we'll be assuming that, or you'll be assuming when you'll be looking at this model at home, we will say that the whole order goes to the incumbent market. So with probability 1 minus gamma, the incoming trader is maybe unsophisticated, is unaware of this new platform, so we'll just go to the incumbent market for sure. With probability one half, the incoming order is uh, split. So it is, and then it's 50-50 about how it is routed. So with probability 50%, it is first routed to the incumbent exchange, and if it exhausts all depth available at the uh, incumbent market at a given price, the rest will be routed to the entry market. With probability 50%, the, the other 50%, it's the other way around. So the order is first routed to the entrant market, and if there is not enough depth at this price to cover the, full, the, the whole order, the remainder of the order uh, goes to market I. So that's the model. And if you go through this, 
this is uh, nothing. There's no rocket science here. What we do is we just use this zero profit condition to derive the probabilities of. Uh, sorry, to say things about these cumulative depths y at some given s price. So we do this and we end up saying that after some manipulations uh, that, well, firstly, on the previous slide, we said that the incumbent market will be deeper than the entrant market, but that's trivial. The more interesting conclusion is that y bar, our total depth in the fragmented market, will be larger than the depth in the consolidated market. So that's the main finding that I announced. To give you a very, very vague intuition that you will obtain uh, by solving the model, by going through the model, this occurs because fragmentation allows limit traders to uh, jump the queue a little bit. So it lowers the importance of price priority in the market. And if you remember, we said that one of the consequences of market fragmentation is that it might lead to violations of priority. And in this case, it might lead to violations of time priority. In particular, if I submit market, if I submit an order to market E, with some probability, I will jump the queue in front of all the limit traders who submitted the orders to market I. And vice versa. So this, in the end, will um, give you larger depth. The, the general intuition is kind of similar to what we had when we talked about time priority versus the pro rata allocation rule. If you remember uh, last week, we said that under pro rata allocation rule, time priority does not matter at all, and the resulting market is deeper. Once again, before we account for the uh, very long-term consequences like traders leaving the market and so on. So this is kind of the same thing that happens here. Uh, so this relies on positive tick size, just like most of Glosten's model. And interestingly, there is also a critical value of gamma, of this trader sophistication, uh, below which the entry market cannot survive. So this is one more way of looking at these barriers to entry, of saying that markets actually need to attract some critical mass of traders in order to um, survive, in order to be viable. Also, one quick note that I just realized is that in Gloston's model, we always have this positive display cost, C, which is not the case in uh, real world, because in most cases we have negative display cost, as I told you, for limit orders. So that's a funny thing to think about. Uh, how, how these markets work with negative uh, C. I guess you still have adverse selection, which is a problem. But, okay, so we will end here. So we talked today about market fragmentation. We saw that nothing is uh, clear-cut. It has some advantages. It has some costs. So trading costs can be higher or lower in fragmented markets. Uh, we, ha we had uh, two pieces of evidence that fragmented markets are deeper in total. And um, yeah, costs and benefits. We talked a little bit about real world regulation, but once again, not uh, that much. And uh, yeah, that's it. So for things to do at home, apart from going to through the Glostons model, you can also solve exercise three in chapter seven on brokers receiving order flow payments and seeing how this affects market, how these order flow payments actually affect uh, market outcomes. And I think this is quite an interesting problem. And I will also upload a couple of articles related to what we talked about on Epsilon. I do not give you any questions to think about because I cannot interrogate you 
on, uh, on, on these articles next week. So just read and enjoy. And thank you for today. Sorry for going a little bit over time. Once again, if you missed the very beginning, there will be no class on Friday. This Friday. So we will be meeting next week. Still on Twitch, almost surely. And as usual, I will stick around for a minute in case you have any questions. And otherwise, thank you. Goodbye. See you next week. Stay healthy.